basically we'll do a brief introduction to RNA sequencing um, technology uh, and then a brief introduction to the first hands-on tutorial and then we'll go back into your Amazon cloud instances that you've now all successfully connected to and we'll do the first uh, hands-on exercise. Um, and you're, you know, you're free to ask questions on the, the little digital cork board, um, but also feel free to just shout out your questions or put your hand up as well. Um, th like I said, this is kind of a, a broad uh, introduction lecture, and so it, it t tends to sometimes raise um, sort of high-level questions about experimental design or sort of variations on how you generate your RNA-seq data in the first place. Uh, so it's one of four, there's, there is kind of a fifth module as well now that's not listed here. That's sort of a, a bite-sized one at the end that we uh, will try to get to if we have enough time. Uh, and the first one is really an introduction to RNA-seq. Um, and the tutorials in this section, the idea here is to provide a, a working example of an RNA-seq analysis pipeline, that's sort of the overall goal. Uh, we want this thing to be able to run in a reasonable amount of time, so you'll see as we go through it in the early ones we're going to introduce reference genomes and the file formats that are involved in this kind of analysis and a test data set that we generated at WashU. Uh, and all of this has been crafted a little bit to allow it to work in a sort of a educational setting like this where the file sizes are kind of carefully managed uh, so that they're small so that when we do things like alignment or expression estimation, we're not waiting for hours for each command to complete. Uh, it all happens quite snappily. Uh, and it's very representative of what it will be like to run the same commands on a full-size data set, um, but that would take much longer. Uh, and I think Obi mentioned this, that our, our goal with this, the, the, on, the sort of hands-on component is that the resource be pretty self-contained and self-explanatory and portable. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to rerun it again uh, after this workshop ends. Uh, and the idea is that if you can do that, then you can easily swap in your own data files uh, and get the commands to work uh, without there being sort of very much of a sort of black box to it. So the, the first module, we're just going to review really the, the theory uh, and practice of RNA sequencing at a high level, uh, including just sort of a general rationale for why we would do sequencing of RNA in the first place, um, some of the challenges that are specific to RNA-seq. So often we have uh, people who come to these workshops that maybe have experience with chip-seq or whole genome or exome sequencing, uh, and there's some uh, particulars to RNA-seq that influence the way we think about analysis and interpretation of the data, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we're going to go over some general goals and themes of RNA-seq analysis workflows. There are many, 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 many tools and workflows out there, um, but they do kind of have a theme uh, to them, so we're going to try to sort of um, illustrate that so that later when you go to try a different workflow, the experience that you had here will help you sort of pick that up more quickly. We'll go through a few common technical questions related to RNA-seq analysis uh, and point you to some additional materials uh, for uh, sort of digging into the, the weeds of some of those technical questions uh, on your own as well. Uh, Anne already talked about getting help outside the course. We'll just briefly re review some options there. Uh, and then, as I said, we'll do the introduction to the, the hands-on tutorial. Um, do I have a pointer here, by chance? Maybe not. A pointer? I guess using the mouse is the desired option. Um, I don't know if that actually works for me, but uh, does that does that work? Um, okay. Thank you. So, just to kind of. Review a lot. So we Obi did the little survey. Who's sort of a wet lab person versus dry lab person? So the wet lab people are probably quite familiar with this. It's sort of a high-level diagram of uh, the central dogma. Uh, but just to kind of put this course in the context of the, the central dogma, that, that's sort of what we use this slide for. Uh, so starting at the top, we have a, a very cartoonish depiction of double-stranded genomic DNA template. Uh, we have an example gene here with three exons uh, and two introns an upstream region and a downstream region. Um, each of these exons uh, is not to scale here for, well, depending on what species, but in human this is definitely not to scale. Most uh, human genes have much larger introns than this relative to the size of the exons. A yeast gene might look like this, though. Uh, they have relatively much smaller introns. <clears throat> uh, so we have a promoter region here where uh, transcription factors bind and transcription is initiated. 
um, and there's a polyadenylation site, uh, and we're sh also shown the sort of translation initiation uh, start point and uh, translation termination uh, codon here. This thing uh, gets transcribed into a single-stranded pre-mRNA molecule where the introns are still in place. Uh, and now we have a whole other set of, of regulatory features that control how the, the splicing is going to happen to remove the introns uh, and stitch the exons together to give us a mature uh, mRNA sequence. And then this mRNA sequence gets uh, polyadenylated and capped uh, and exported to the cytoplasm uh, where from the nucleus to the cytoplasm where translation occurs, uh, where we go from an mRNA molecule to a protein sequence. Uh, which is then folded, and there's various post-translational modifications that may be attached. Um, for many biological questions, if we if we could do so, we uh, if we could sequence the the protein sequences directly somehow in a high throughput fashion, interrogate their sequence and structure, uh, we would probably just do that. Um, that's generally not feasible. It, to the extent that we can do it, it's very low throughput and expensive by comparison to our abilities to profile DNA and RNA. Uh, so RNA-seq is really focused on, on this part, and uh, it, for many people it's a proxy for the protein. So we're looking at RNA structure and abundance, uh, and from that we're trying to infer things that are happening at the protein level often. Um, of course, there are many exceptions. Yes? So one of my questions back is if you wanted to kind of separate the nucleus from the cytoplasm, or like RNA-seq, kind of like pre-sequence and post-sequence, like what would be the worthwhile like, to kind of get information yeah, de depending on what you're doing, especially if you're studying the process of transcription and splicing, that might be interesting. And there are a lot of variations on the sort of standard or typical run-of-the-mill RNA-seq experiments, and some of them involve manipulations like this, where we're trying to isolate uh, nuclei, or we're trying to specifically enrich for RNA that are in the cytoplasm, or are perhaps bound by ribosomes, so that indicates they're actively being translated. So depending on where your interest lies, if you're really focused on the sort of protein coding part of the problem, that might influence you to choose one of those techniques. Um, if you're really interested in, in the actual splicing and transcriptional machinery, you might do something like looking at um, immature RNAs from the nucleus. Um, but generally, the, the sort of standard RNA-seq protocol that you'll, a lot of the data is being generated from um, is making some attempt to enrich for uh, mature mRNAs or to deplete out the, the ribosomal RNAs um, in an attempt to, to kind of concentrate your data onto exonic regions so that you're not spending a lot of time sequencing uh, introns um, or, or other things. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Um, so usually at this point, uh, this is, I point out that we have this depiction here of a sort of hypothetical RNA sequence where the exons have been stitched together. Um, and just like it would be nice if we could just sequence protein sequences directly, it would actually be nice if we could just sequence these entire full-length uh, RNA uh, species. Um, unfortunately, RNA-seq isn't really directly sequencing these things. So first of all, it's not sequencing RNA. The RNA is being converted to cDNA, and then we're sequencing cDNA. And generally, we're not sequencing very long cDNAs either. So uh, there's a f almost always a fragmentation step uh, involved in the creation of your RNA-seq data where this thing, which may be a KB or 5KB or 10KB or even longer, is being fragmented into small pieces in the range of, say, 250 to 400 bases, and those things are being sequenced. So we're sequencing pieces of RNA that were converted to cDNA. Uh, and so there's several molecular biology steps there that um, we need to keep in mind when we're trying to influence the data, in, uh, interpret the data. Um, in particular, this idea that we're trying to think about full-length transcripts and sort of map these things back to what we think the full-length RNA look, will look like and what we think the full-length protein will look like, but we're doing that from these sort of small pieces of the puzzle. So there's a lot of inference that's involved, um, and that creates uncertainty. Uh, so we should always keep that uncertainty in mind, that we're, we're kind of inferring what we think the full-length sequence looks like by what we see in terms of the fragments that we're sequencing. So this is kind of a, a, a typical uh, RNA-seq workflow um, at a very high level. So imagine that we have some samples of interest, condition one and condition two. So it might be a tumor and a normal. 
uh, or in our example data set where we've kind of just arbitrarily picked a couple quite different samples that will, we expected will produce a lot of differences to allow us a lot of differences to look at when we do the analysis. Um, from each of these samples of interest, we isolate RNA um, and then generate uh, cDNA from that RNA, fragment it, size select it, uh, and add sequencing uh, linkers. So that's what's depicted there in the, with the blue and the yellow. So these are our, our small fragments made up from the, the larger RNAs. Then these fragments get uh, flowed across uh, a sequencing flow cell. Uh, by far, Illumina is the most common platform for this. Is anyone here working with data that's generated on a different platform from Illumina? Say, yeah, which one? PacBio, Pac okay. So PacBio is, is capable of producing much longer reads, and that's sort of the niche that it fills is the sort of long read uh, technology. So there's a potential to, to, with a lot more accuracy, characterize the structure of longer RNAs without having to do as much of this inference and piecing uh, the pieces together. Um, but it sounds like everyone else is working with the Lumina data for a while. There was quite a lot of ion torrent data uh, that has sort of, sort of fallen by the wayside and really Illumina is um, dominating <clears throat> the market right now. So for most of you, your fragments are being flowed across an Illumina uh, sequencing flow cell uh, and then you're generating uh, potentially hundreds of millions of paired end reads off of that flow cell where you have uh, a fragment that's being sequenced from the left side and from the right side off of the sequencing adapters. Uh, and if the fragment is big enough, there will be some space in the middle that remains unsequenced. Uh, if your reads are long enough and your fragment is a little bit shorter, then the two reads might meet in the middle where you effectively have sequenced the entire fragment. And you'll usually have a mixture of those two scenarios where you have a range of fragment sizes uh, and sometimes your reads uh, meet in the middle and sometimes they don't. Uh, and then uh, really the analysis st starts from the point of having this, these raw sequence reads, uh, usually in FASTQ format where we have a read1 file and a read2 file and we start aligning these things against reference transcripts and reference genomes uh, and doing the downstream analysis and that's really uh, everything that we're going to be talking about in this course is this downstream analysis part here. So why would you sequence RNA versus DNA? Probably don't have to convince anyone in this room since you're all already interested. Um, but generally, a lot of people working in functional studies, so the, these are cases where the genome may be a sort of fixed uh, factor, but the, the transcriptome is varying uh, in response to, say, drug treatment. So we heard about some people working on uh, experiments that involve drug resistance or mechanisms of drug response. Um, you might be working in model organisms where you've genetically manipulated, uh, say, by creating a knockout mouse. Um, we, I heard someone mention uh, gene annotation. So RNA-seq has really kind of revolutionized the field of geno genome annotation. It used to be a lot of predictive work where we would sequence the, the reference genome, the DNA, and then we would look at the sequence of the DNA and we would try to predict where does it look like the genes are, what looks like an exon, what looks like an intron, how might those exons get, get stitched together just by looking at the sequence and its conservation and other features of it. Um, and there was sort of a whole field of bioinformatics focused on this problem of how do you look at the reference genome sequence and predict what a gene structure actually will be. RNA-seq has really made that uh, approach kind of uh, irrelevant in a way because now we can just shotgun sequence vast amounts of transcriptome uh, sequence data and align it against a reference genome and then let the data tell us what the exon intron structure is and where transcription is happening uh, in what conditions and at what uh, levels of abundance. Um, there are some molecular features that simply can only be observed at the RNA level, so things like alternative isoforms, fusion transcripts were mentioned, um, RNA editing, uh, and other features. Uh, for people uh, in this sort of cancer space, uh, sequence RNA-seq is commonly done to help interpret mutations that don't have an obvious effect on protein sequence, so it's a way to try to interpret potentially regulatory mutations that don't affect a protein sequence but may uh, have a regulatory consequence, uh, or to prioritize protein coding somatic mutations uh, to figure out sort of which of them are actually being expressed, uh, is there evidence for haploinsufficiency, um, is there evidence for allele-specific expression of a mutation, uh, and so on. Some of the challenges that are particular to RNA-seq, so these things that I'm sure have come up uh, in each of your experiments to some degree. Um, first, starting with the sample. Uh, so sample purity is, is a, a, often a problem in, in disease uh, studies where you have some tissue state that represents a disease like a tumor uh, and it may not be 
purely tumor cells. Um, there may be normal cells mixed in, or if you're studying a particular cell lineage and you isolate it, you have to sort it, uh, or you have some other way of enriching, and those things are never perfect. Um, of course, sample quantity is, is always a a challenge and if you have a very small sample, so there are people studying things in mice where they're isolating a very particular part of the mouse and you just don't have that many cells to deal with. Uh, RNA quality is often a big issue, so we'll talk a bit more about that. RNA is much more fragile than DNA, so it tends to degrade and the degradation can lead to problems uh, in both generating your data uh, and um, analyzing and interpreting and comparing across samples. Um, another Challenges particular to RNA seq is that the that RNAs consist of small exons in, in many species that are separated by very large introns. So this creates a, an alignment, a read alignment challenge relative to say whole genome sequencing, where in whole genome sequencing, for most reads, there's an expectation that the read will align against the reference as one contiguous block, that it won't uh, be spanning across an intron. So RNA seq aligners have this additional challenge of looking for uh, reads where part of the read maps to the edge of an exon, and then there could be 50 kb of intron, and then the rest of the read aligns to the, the next exon over, um, and that's quite a, of a challenging thing computationally to figure out um, where those pieces of reads uh, align to, and it increases the uncertainty uh, in uh, alignments for RNA-seq uh, relative to uh, DNA sequencing technologies. Um, the relative abundance of RNAs very wild very wide, wildly. So again, comparing to DNA, if you sequence the genome of a critter, you have this sort of basic uh, assumption going into it that you'll see approximately equal representation of each of the chromosomes. So if it's a, a diploid state, you'll see two copies of everything. Uh, and you can sort of target your sequencing uh, with the size of the genome in mind and say, oh, I want to get 30x coverage of the whole genome. And when I look at the data, I, uh, if I generate enough data, I can see approximately evil, even coverage, you know, wa waivers up and down a little bit because of GC content and random sampling. But for the most part, you get this nice uniform coverage across your genome. Uh, in the transcriptome, of course, we don't expect that because we have different RNA species being expressed at different levels uh, that are functional. So you have some genes that are functional and expressed at just a few copies per cell, and you have other genes that are are expressed at tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of copies per cell, and that's just sort of the normal expected state. Uh, so we have this, this wide range from estimates vary from sort of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7, sort of the, the, the orders of magnitude from the, the most lowly expressed things uh, at sort of 1 up to maybe 10 to the 7. Uh, and since RNA sequencing works by random sampling, we have this problem that the most highly expressed things we tend to be able to sequence them very readily. Things that are lowly expressed, it's harder to sequence them because they just, it takes a lot of, you gotta like reach your hand into the, that bag a lot of times to, to randomly pull out reads that correspond to those uh, rare uh, transcripts. Um, and then ribosomal and mitochondrial genes tend to be uh, classes of genes that have this really, really high abundance. So we tend to see a lot of data corresponding to those kinds of genes uh, in our RNA-seq libraries. Uh, and relative to protein coding genes, sometimes they can drown out the, the stuff that we're more interested in, potentially. Similar to the, the relative abundance challenge, RNAs also come in a wide range of sizes. Uh, so again, comparing to genomic DNA, uh, for all intents and purposes, all of the chromosomes are massive uh, compared to the, the size of the fragments that we're sequencing. So they're sort of arbitrarily large megabases, usually, possibly tens or hundreds of megabases. Um, but RNAs are expressed and functional at this much smaller and wide range of sizes. So you have some RNAs that are you know, 20 bases long, and you have other RNAs that are 100 KB long, and they're all expressed together, and we're trying to characterize them all together, uh, and this can introduce some bias. So we have potential to miss out on really small RNAs that we might care about because of the way we select our library fragments. We may be throwing away RNAs that are smaller than a certain size, um, and there may be a, a, a tendency to uh, overrepresent because it's a little bit easier to sequence the large RNAs than the small RNAs in some sense. Um, in other senses, the, the small RNAs can dominate um, uh, cluster generation on a flow cell, so it kind of introduces bias. We would like to, to get this true representation of the relative abundance of transcripts um, in the transcriptome, but this relative size uh, 
issue sort of complicates that a little bit. Uh, and I mentioned already that RNA is very fragile compared to DNA, so it gets easily degraded. Uh, many of you have probably seen these uh, Agilent uh, bioanalyzer traces where uh, you run a, a small sample of your RNA, usually at the total RNA stage, uh, on this sort of lab on a chip. It's effectively you're running a gel, but you're running it through a capillary. Uh, so it's capillary electrophoresis, and you get this readout of, uh, that's like a trace uh, where the, the peaks represent the abundance of RNA that's coming out over time as the RNA uh, runs past a detector. The smallest RNAs come out first, and the largest RNAs take longer to come through. Uh, and then over time, you get this profile that's sort of a series of spikes. Um, and in, in, so this is a human uh, sample. Uh, in human samples, you expect in total RNA something like 95 to 98 percent of the RNA to, to correspond to two ribosomal RNA species. Uh, so with that expectation in mind, we, we hope to see these two very big peaks that we're seeing here on the, the right of this slide. Um, and based on the sort of how intact those two peaks are, uh, we can estimate the, the quality and intactness of the, the RNA sample. Uh, so this is a an example of some RNA that I isolated a long time ago from a cell line that's very, you know, almost perfect quality, and it got a, a RNA integrity number of 10, which is sort of a perfect score. Uh, and you see these two really strong peaks corresponding to the 28S and 18S uh, ribosomal peaks. Um, and you don't see a lot of uh, anything else. So you see a sort of a marker down here uh, and not much else. As the RNA gets degraded, these RNAs uh, at these sizes start to break down into smaller pieces. As the pieces get smaller, you start to see additional sort of bands on your gel or, or spikes on your uh, electrophorogram <laughs> here, uh, and you sort of get this sort of choppy uh, additional spiky spikes uh, to the left of your, your two expected peaks. And the more degraded the sample is, the harder it becomes to see the, the 18S and 28S peak, uh, and based on this pattern of uh, degradation, you can estimate sort of a, a, a RNA quality score. So this is a RIN score of six. Um, and a lot of sequencing cores will, will do this assay and they'll have a cutoff that says if the RIN score is below some level, um, we don't want to sequence your sample or we're going to have some kind of caveat that sort of, you know, if things go wrong, you still have to pay us even if the data sucks, um, something like that. Um, so have any of you encountered that scenario with sort of RNA quality issues where, okay, yeah. So for people that aren't used to um, looking at these, um, these traces, I provide, uh, we provide a link to a PDF here with a whole bunch of examples of these traces from RNA that was isolated from uh, different types of samples. So frozen tissue, FFP samples, cell lines, um, a, sort of showing you this broad range of scenarios, everything from just perfect intact RNA to completely degraded. There's like basically hardly anything left um, and everything in between. So you can kind of uh, put your, your traces in perspective if you haven't looked at a lot of these yet. And over time, you kind of get a sense of what they look like and um, when, when things have potentially gone wrong or sort of standing out from the, the norm. Um, some design considerations. So, are any of you in the kind of RNA seq design experiment stage? Does everyone have their data already? Um, how many people have data in hand, kind of already? Okay, quite a few of you, and others that are sort of thinking of, they have RNA seq experiment that may be planned in the next six months or something. Okay, great. So that's this is pretty typical for this course. Uh, the course comes around, and there's some people that are in the design consideration stage. Um, so there's a couple references here to useful um, guidelines. Even if you already have your data, it's still useful to think about these things. There's always the next experiment, uh, and it may help you to think about um, how to analyze your, your current data to think about some of the sort of best practices and recommendations for how to design an RNA-seq experiment. Uh, so we link to this standards uh, and guidelines document that was generated by the ONCODE consortium. It's a little while ago, but these are really fundamental things that don't change. So this talks about you know, how many replicates should you use, what kind of sequencing depth should you target, uh, what kind of control experiments and reporting <laughs> standards should you think about including. And in our example data, we're going to talk a bit about this and analyze some, um, we're going to do some QC analysis and we're also going to analyze some uh, spike in uh, data. So in our uh, data generation, we included uh, some QC spike ins. Uh, 
um, to help assess the, the quality of the RNA-seq library uh, construction and sequencing. And there's several of these large-scale consortium sequencing projects that uh, in their early stages sort of think hard about how they want to design their experiment and then they release guidelines and these can be really useful for people that even down to a much more modest experiment that sort of I have five conditions or three conditions and I'm you know doing a much more focused biology experiment. Um, there's a lot of RNA-seq library construction strategies so we talked a little bit about the sort of sequencing nuclear RNA versus ribosomal RNA or uh, cytoplasmic RNA. Um, there are a whole bunch of factors that you see being varied in some of the, the RNA-seq data generation uh, steps. So uh, there used to be a lot of poly-A RNA being generated uh, and that's kind of shifted a little bit to being more focused on um, this total RNA approach. Um, so how many people here, is anyone doing an mRNA isolation or purification before generating their, their RNA-seq data? Do you know? Um, one, so a couple. So this used to be much more common um, because it was a really great way of enriching for the actual um, protein coding RNAs. Uh, the things that are already polyadenylated tend to be mature RNAs that have already been spliced uh, and that are likely to be uh, protein, correspond to protein coding genes. Um, but in the last several years, um, some kits have really improved that allow you to do a little bit more holistic uh, representation of the transcriptome where um, you just sequence total RNA and instead of uh, enriching for the polyadenylated RNAs, you do a ribo reduction, uh, which is mentioned on the next line here. Uh, size selection is something that's done, sometimes it's done before uh, cDNA synthesis, uh, so you're actually fragmenting the RNA, sometimes it's done after cDNA synthesis where you're fragmenting the cDNA. Um, they're generally, um, even though I mentioned that there's a sort of holistic approach to sequencing the whole transcriptome, it's not really true. There's a bunch of caveats uh, to the, the sort of most common uh, TrueSeq uh, Illumina RNA-seq kit. And one of them is that it's still doing a pretty substantial size selection. So small RNAs are pretty much deliberately getting tossed. So you're not going to be uh, getting good representation of microRNAs, of tRNAs, uh, of snow RNAs, a lot of that stuff is, is gone. So if you're really interested in snow RNA biology, it's likely that the RNA, the sort of standard RNA-seq approach that someone will have on a, a, a core uh, service list um, is not suitable for that. <clears throat> um, there used to be some kits that were quite popular for, that involved a linear amplification step. So this is something you might do if you have really, really limited, so you're studying stem cells or really rare tumor cells or something. Um, so some people are still doing that. Uh, there used to be a lot of a mix of stranded versus unstranded data. So this is where you've, uh, uh, in the stranded data, you've encoded the data in such a way that you can figure out for each read what strand it was likely transcribed from. Uh, it used to be that you didn't have that information, so you would just align the reads against the reference, and you didn't know for actually which strand it was transcribed from, and you would infer that based on the way it aligned to a known gene, or perhaps if it had, uh, if it encompassed a splicing event, then you can get a pretty strong inference from what strand it came from. But now that's kind of built into library construction, and most people are working uh, nowadays with uh, stranded libraries. Uh, there are still quite a few scenarios where people are doing an exome capture of their RNA-seq library. Uh, so this is where you basically take your RNA, you make an RNA-seq library essentially as you would normally, and then you hybridize it against uh, a probe set that corresponds to all of the known exons uh, of your genome. Uh, and this enriches for fragments that actually correspond to known genes. Uh, and this is commonly used as a way of sort of rescuing samples that are quite degraded, where some of the other uh, enrichment steps don't work as well. Um, library normalization is an attempt to deal with the problem where you have really, really highly expressed species of RNA and really lowly expressed, or sort of an attempt to sort of even things out a little bit. Um, and so there's a lot of details here, and we'll, in the wiki we'll point to a whole bunch of materials where you can really get into the weeds and find things that are relevant to your particular experimental setup. Um, but the main point here is that these details can really affect the analysis strategy. So if you have uh, a set of RNA-seq uh, uh, libraries uh, and you have the data for those things and within your the data that you're going to try to compare to each other, if they vary on any of these factors, uh, that could cause a problem. So you could be 
seeing batch effects instead of biological effect um, if you're trying to compare uh, two conditions where it's not just the condition that's varying, but the way the RNA-seq library was constructed. Uh, this figure is just kind of an overview of, um, with a little bit more detail of, of how you actually make an RNA-seq library. So you start with uh, a tissue, you isolate total RNA. Usually at this step we assess RNA quality um, by either running it on a gel. Most people don't do this anymore. These are kind of synthetic gels showing a couple examples. So you have totally intact RNA here, uh, and this is what it would look like on the Agilent uh, electrophorogram. So you've got two peaks, two bands, um, and then as the RNA gets uh, more degraded, uh, you go to a pattern that looks more like this, where you've got partially degraded total RNA. You can still see the peak, the 18S and 28S peaks a little bit, uh, and then as the RNA gets degraded more, it looks more and more uh, like a smear. Uh, so we start getting smaller and smaller bands on our gel uh, until eventually we just have a sort of indistinguishable smear of small things. Uh, and this is what a uh, Agilent electrophorogram looks like when the RNA has been pretty much degraded to completion. Uh, generally, you still do have small RNA fragments left. There seems to be a little bit of a floor where the RNA doesn't degrade uh, or it starts to degrade more slowly once it's all in fragments of, say, 100 to 150 bases in size, which is kind of convenient because it does mean you can often still do some profiling of RNA that's pretty heavily degraded. Once you've assessed the quality, uh, it's typical uh, with your total RNA to do a DNA's uh, treatment to try to remove genomic DNA that may still be in your sample, uh, and then some kind of enrichment potentially. Uh, so we talked about some of those enrichment strategies on the previous slide. Uh, then you're going to do cDNA synthesis, um, and you're going to take those cDNAs and often do a size selection uh, and add sequencing adapters. At this point, your small RNAs are typically lost, so you're selecting for fragments that are above some size. Uh, the size selection is not perfect, so it'll be sort of incomplete. Uh, you wind up with uh, your fragments with the sequencing adapters attached, uh, and this library of fragments is what goes onto the, the machine for sequencing. So I mentioned the enrichment strategies. There's several enrichment strategies uh, that I've already touched upon, uh, starting with doing no enrichment at all. No one does this. You, basically, no one ever sequenced just straight total RNA because all you would do is sequence the same ribosomal RNAs over and over and over again. Uh, but that's what's depicted here in A, where we've got this pool of complex RNAs, and it's totally represented uh, in the total RNA pool. Um, Probably the most common strategy is to do a ribosomal RNA reduction step. So this is where you have a bunch of probes that correspond to ribosomal RNA sequences. You take your total RNA, you hybridize them with those probes, and you basically try to pull out the ribosomal RNA species and enrich for everything else that's left. Uh, the main alternative to that is poly A selection, where instead of trying to remove the ribosomal RNAs, we're trying to grab onto and hold onto the things that are polyadenylated and then wash everything else away. Um, and one of the main caveats of that approach is that if any of your RNAs are degraded a bit and you hold on to their poly A tail, which is at the three prime end, you're losing five, the five prime ends potentially because anywhere where the RNA was broken, that piece is going to be lost when you grab onto the three prime uh, end of the transcript. And then cDNA capture is kind of uh, an orthogonal approach where you're not selecting for polyadenylated species and you're not trying to pull out the ribosomal RNAs, you're just directly trying to target. Uh, known exon sequences and, and enrich for those. Uh, and I would say all three of these are still in, in relatively common use, depending on uh, what your experimental scenario is. Any questions on that? Right. Uh, I briefly mentioned the stranded versus unstranded library. So this is a sort of cartoon depiction of what uh, we've taken some uh, reads from a a stranded library and an unstranded library, we line them against the reference genome and then we've colored them according to their uh, sequencing strand. Uh, and we can see in an unstranded library here on the top that you just get this sort of random mixture of reads that are from uh, either strand and you don't know which strand was actually being transcribed. Uh, but with the stranded libraries now you have this information that basically tells you, okay, it looks, uh, looks like this read came from the positive strand or the, or, was, or the negative strand in terms of where it was transcribed from. And on the right hand here, we're showing an IGV screenshot of some actual data that was produced with one of these stranded libraries. And then the, the coloring of the reads is based on the, uh, the, 
the strand reported by uh, for each sequencing read. Uh, so you can see that it's it's pretty close to, to perfect in terms of identifying uh, reads in this case that were from the the positive strand for this gene that's going this way, um, and then for the the negative strand on this gene that happens to be going uh, the other way. So we've got two genes that are sort of um, in a head to tail fashion. And the read uh, strand identities seem to be matching up pretty well. Replicates is a common question that comes up. How many replicates should we do? Um, there's generally sort of different kinds of, of replicates that we can think about, um, technical, experimental, and biological. Um, I would typically think of technical replicates as being things really sort of instrument level. So do we need to worry about different flow cells producing variability or different lanes on the same flow cell? Um, should we worry about that kind of variability, sort of run-to-run -run variability produced by the, the sequencing instrument itself? Uh, the answer is generally no. Uh, the Illumina platform has become pretty robust, uh, so you can take the same library and sequence it on one flow cell, and then next week you can sequence it on another flow cell. And if you look at the, those two data sets, they'll generally correlate extremely well. Um, that's what's being depicted here on the right, um, just an example where we've got two lanes generated from the same um, library and they're very, very highly correlated. Um, of course, experimental replicates and biological replicates are still important and it's very difficult to say how many replicates you have without really thinking about your biological condition and how much variability there is there, um, but they are as important uh, as they will always be uh, in biological experiments. Some of the common analysis goals of RNA-seq, so things that we can ask of RNA-seq data, that many of which we're going to talk about or cover in this course. So we're really going to focus on gene expression and differential expression, uh, a little bit more on alternative expression analysis, uh, both in the second and the third day, uh, transcript discovery and annotation. Uh, we're going to talk about that a fair bit. Uh, we're going to briefly touch on the concept of allele-specific expression relating to either common polymorphisms or, in the case of uh, cancer, could be somatic mutations. Um, people are doing mutation discovery in RNA-seq data um, for various reason, uh, reasons and scenarios. Fusion detection, similarly. Uh, RNA editing we don't uh, touch on, but um, the sort of tools that you would need to start identifying RNA edits will be sort of made available to you uh, during the next... Uh, a couple days. All of these uh, questions that we ask of RNA-seq data generally have a particular set of tools that you chain together into a workflow to go from raw data uh, to some kind of more interpretable uh, output uh, that you can do sort of more final uh, and human readable analysis on. Um, so there's many, many tools and many workflows, but they have the sort of general themes. Um, and they all kind of follow this pattern of starting with raw data perhaps converting it from one file format to another file format, um, aligning or assembling those reads, and then pro processing the alignment or the assembly with a tool that's specific for a goal. So for example, cufflinks or string tie for expression analysis, or defuse or chimera scan for fusion detection. Um, and then usually after you run those sort of question-specific bioinformatics tools, there'll be some kind of post-processing. Uh, so the tool will output some kind of crazy, usually custom file format that they invented and only they fully understand. Uh, and there'll be some kind of cleanup or filtering or further uh, munging to sort of pull out uh, actual observations that you can follow up on further. And then uh, there'll be a summarization and visualization step. So this is where you're actually creating your figures or viewing the data in some kind of uh, interactive browser. Uh, we already talked about Biostar, so we'll think we'll just skip this exercise. If you haven't used Biostar, I definitely recommend it as a place to, to check out and sign up and ask a question uh, if you have one. Um, some of the common questions that typically come up in this course, uh, so things like, should I uh, remove duplicates for RNA-seq data? The answer is generally no. Um, and the reason we specifically cover this is because so many workflows do involve duplicate uh, marking. Uh, basically any workflow involving DNA analysis, the anytime you have a fragment with a read one and read two, where you have two fragments that seem to start and end at exactly the same position, the default assumption in most DNA sequencing experiments is that those things are potentially amplification artifacts and that we should just collapse them down to one observation uh, and that it wouldn't happen very often by chance that we'd have a fragment that starts and ends at exactly the same place. 
Uh, and if you do simulations for whole genome data, for example, if you sequence your whole genome data with fragments that range from size, say, 200 to 350, and you're targeting, say, 30 or 40x average coverage of the whole genome, there's an extremely low probability that two reads, two fragments start and end at exactly the same place. Um, so it doesn't do you any harm to remove them, and you get to remove all of these uh, amplification artifacts. Unfortunately, in RNA-seq, the situation is quite different. Um, so we're not sequencing chunks of huge chromosomes. We're sequencing RNA-seq, or uh, we're sequencing RNA fragments. Um, and as I mentioned, some of those RNA fragments are expressed at really, really high levels in each cell, and some of them are quite small. So you can have a gene that's a relatively modest size, say it's only 300 or 400 bases long, and it's expressed at tens of thousands of copies per cell. Well, now when we're representing that RNA-seq, uh, species, there actually is a pretty high chance that we'll get two fragments that are the same just by chance, because there's just not that many fragments that you can get out of uh, that small thing that are, say, 300 bases long. Um, so we gen for that reason, we generally don't mark duplicates in RNA RNA-seq experiments. And even if you do mark them, most of the downstream tools will just ignore the marking. Um, so in that sense, it's kind of convenient that it generally won't do any harm if you, if you run one of the typical duplicate marking steps. How much library depth? Of course, this depends on many factors. Um, how much data you generate will influence sort of how rich of a question you can ask of the data set. Um, if you just want gene expression estimates, so if you've been doing microarray experiments and you just want sort of to reproduce what you would get from a microarray experiment, uh, abundances at the gene level for a set of known genes, um, you can get away with a relatively small amount of RNA-seq data, so you can really multiplex. And in that scenario, you might really benefit from having more samples with a smaller amount of data to increase your statistical power. And so there's a number of papers that we reference on the wiki that kind of sort of formally address this question of what's the, the minimal amount of data that, or the most efficient way to design an experiment where I have a finite amount of, of money, which is always the case, uh, and I can either choose more samples or sequencing each sample more deeply, where's the right balance? And I think the estimates come out to something like 20 to 25 million reads should be plenty sufficient for each sample if you just care about gene expression estimation. Um, but of course, for many RNA-seq experiments, we care about a lot more than that. So um, just telling the sort of approximate abundance of a gene is not nearly as hard as characterizing the exon intron structure of that gene or doing mutation calling. Um, so you really have to think about what you want to do with the data when you make this decision. Um, of course, other things like the tissue type or RNA preparation or the quality of the input RNA or library construction method may also influence the amount of data you need to generate. Um, so if the RNA is degraded uh, or if there's some impurity to it, you may need to do to generate more data. Um, the read length, whether your reads are paired or, or not paired, may also influence. Um, so one recommendation we usually make is to just try and find a publication that had a sort of similar experimental design to what you're thinking about uh, and use that as a starting point. Even better than that, do a pilot experiment where you kind of do a bit of an overkill on a small number of samples, uh, and then you can look at the data and you can do some downsampling experiments and sort of figure out what the sweet spot is in your conditions, in your lab, with whatever peculiar factors that you have in play. Um, the good news is that the amount of data you can get from a HiSeq uh, instrument now is so spectacular that I would say uh, one lane or half a lane even, or even less, maybe a third of a lane is sufficient for most of these purposes. Uh, what mapping strategy? Uh, this used to be a lot more of a common issue where we had quite a range of, of read lengths. Um, does anyone here have reads or working with reads that are shorter than 50 bases? See this still sometimes. What kind of lengths is it? How many people have something that's like 2 by 100 reads? Okay, so a few of you. Anything else? Like 75 mers? Or? 75 to 300. Okay. 75, okay. Yeah, so if your reads are 75 or larger, you're probably going to want to do an alignment where you're, uh, you have enough information to try to do this alignment across the intron boundaries. Um, so you might as well use a splice-aware aligner. If you have really short reads, and sometimes people are doing this to save money, again, if they, if they want to profile a huge number of samples, say you have 1,000 samples, uh, 
Um, and it's all about comparing a bunch of conditions within those samples, and you just want to get gene expression abundance estimates out of them. You might choose to sequence single end or maybe uh, paired 50 MERS or even shorter. So you still see this because it, it's cheaper and you can process more samples that way. Um, and then, but then in that scenario, you might want to not use a splice aware aligner. So you might go back to something like uh, bow tie. Um, and the aligners are generally getting better at kind of handling uh, both scenarios. Um, but it's just yeah, something to keep in mind. Um, the last question here is sort of what if I don't have a reference genome? So this also influences some of the, the previous questions. So what, what genome you're actually talking about influences things and whether you have a reference genome may influence things as well. So some people have a great reference genome, some people have a very draft reference genome, some people don't have one at all. Some people have a decent set of reference transcripts, but not really much in terms of the actual reference genome sequence. Um, so usually at this point, I kind of do a bit of a survey. Um, how many people are working with data that came from, say, prokaryotes? Any, any prokaryotes? A couple? Yeah. Okay. So no splicing for you generally. Um, what, so the rest of you are eukaryotes, I guess? Is that true? Okay. How many people with human data? Okay. So the human people are kind of lucky in a way because so much money and resources have like been spent on producing the best reference genome, considering the size of the human genome. The quality of the reference genome is really good for human, and millions of dollars have been spent annotating it and producing reference transcript data sets and high-quality full-length cDNA data sets and on and on and on, all of this characterization. So there's a almost you know, too many resources. You're overwhelmed by the number of databases and data sets and annotation tools and resources and sets of transcripts that are out there for human. It's almost the challenge is like figuring out which ones to use or what's best for your scenario. Um, but then other species, not so much like that. Um, so what about um, any yeast? Anyone with yeast? No. Fungi? Any, any mushrooms or... No mushrooms. Plants? Any plant people? One, two, three, four. Wow, I think that's a record. I don't think we've ever had four plant. So what plants? We have them. Okay. Uh, potatoes, tomatoes, and tobacco. Okay. Wheat. Wheat? Okay. Wheat. Wheat, okay. So how many of you have reference genomes? Sort of half of you. Is anyone else? Who doesn't have a reference genome for their species? The back. So what are those? Uh, yeah. Okay. No reference in at the back? And what, what are those things? <laughs> uh, cold salmon and sea lions. Oh, there's no salmon reference genome? There's Atlantic salmon, but they're, they're okay. and right. Atlantic and Pacific are very much removed, so okay. you can use a little bit, but there's too much variation. And the other one was sea lice. Yeah, which is a crustacean. Okay, and there's no, is there not a reference at all for the sea uh, lice? There's, no, there's some ESTs, though, like it's very... Okay. Cool. Right, so we have a really wide mix, which is also typical for this course of people that have... Yeah, species with very little, sort of they're on the frontier of characterizing that species, and then on the other end of the spectrum as billions of dollars have been spent uh, preparing resources that will be helpful for them, um, and a bunch of stuff in between. Um, so there'll be m sort of several points during the this course where um, some things will apply to some of you and not all of you, or where there'll be a bit of nuance to how you would apply it to your species. Um, and I would encourage you to, you know, ask questions or talk to us, um, any of us individually, about your particular scenario, and um, we'll see if we can learn more about what, what in particular would be helpful to you. Um, some of the tools that we're going to talk about are quite uh, reference-free, so they'll work just sort of on the raw data. Usually, with the, usually it's good if you at least have a reference transcriptome. If you have a transcriptome and a genome, then that's even better. Sort of all options are open to you, um, and sort of. If you have, don't have those things, then <clears throat> you may uh, need to do some sort of preliminary work to characterize your species before you go further. Um, so I think if you don't have a reference genome at all, then um, it's tempting to, to ask, how can we get a reference genome 
generated because it's just such a useful tool um, for you know studying that species uh, both at the gene when you're studying additional genomes and of course the transcriptome as well. Um, but we can talk more about that with uh, with you individually on your particular critters. Um, there's this reference to the the wiki now where we have more common questions and their answers. I'm going to go through the, the RNA-seq wiki and I'll review that, that section uh, specifically to sort of point out where you can uh, access that. Um, so now I'm just going to jump straight into the, the tutorial introduction um, and I'll probably blaze through this pretty quick. Um, so we're going to just uh, in a minute here start the first hands-on tutorial. Um, so there's four, five modules and each of them has a hands-on component. This is going to be the first one, so we're going to follow this pattern where we do a bit of an intro lecture. This lecture was the longest one, I think, uh, so the following lectures will get shorter and shorter and you'll spend more and more of your time at the command line uh, running commands and thinking about how to do the analysis. The first one starts out fairly basic, so the, the very first goal is to actually practice installing a bunch of commonly used RNA-seq tools. Uh, so we wanted to, this to not be a black box where you felt like you needed this special environment to have been created for you in order to, to run the analysis that you're going to do over the next two days. Uh, so we're going to show basically how all of the tools were installed that we're going to use uh, so that later if you want to run this on your own compute cluster, uh, you'll have a kind of reference point for uh, how to install these kinds of tools. And generally just doing, for the people who are kind of just getting into bioinformatics command line analysis, Installing and updating and maintaining tools in all of their versions is one of the most tedious and painful uh, and hair-pulling aspects of bioinformatics. Um, but you kind of just have to pull the band-aid off and get used to it. So this is sort of an attempt to um, show some examples of, of what it looks like so that it becomes a little bit less foreign uh, in the future. <clears throat> uh, and then we're going to move into really the RNA-seq uh, specific stuff. So we're going to obtain a reference genome. Uh, we've kind of created a sort of bite-sized version of the human reference genome to work with here. Uh, we're going to obtain gene and transcript annotations, talk about where you get those kinds of annotations using human as an example, uh, and then we're going to uh, dig into the GTF file format, which is one of the most commonly uh, used file formats for representing transcript annotations. Uh, so it'll be used for many of your species. We'll have a GTF file somewhere that someone has created. Um, we're going to index the, the reference genome files for, for use with the aligners. We'll talk a bit about uh, why we do indexing. Uh, and then we're going to obtain our raw sequence data that we're going to use for the, the downstream analysis. So we have sort of uh, three main components here, the reference genome, the reference transcriptome, and then the actual raw RNA-seq data. Uh, and then we're, and we're going to talk about the formats for each of those, those files. I think Obi briefly talked about this, sort of some of the common gotchas or problems that come up while working the tutorials. Um, there is, uh, there are some of these commands are just really long, so in the interests of uh, everyone being able to get through the, the full workflow from raw data to sort of final interpretation, uh, some of the, the longer commands are just provided to you and you're encouraged to kind of copy and paste those. Short commands you can type carefully. Um, but kind of, you know, figure out the logistics of how you copy and paste from the wiki into your terminal. There were also sprinkled throughout the whole workshop, there are practical exercises where you're not given the commands. Um, and though we will kind of do those on the side so that you really have to type it all out yourself and think about how to construct these, these complex commands. So we're kind of trying to balance two things here. One is wanting you to actually learn how to construct these commands uh, on your own. And the other is to be able to go through this relatively complicated workflow where each step depends on a previous step, so things need to, to all work for it all to come together at the end. Watch out for copy and paste errors. So sometimes you'll copy something from the wiki onto the command line and you'll be missing the end of it. Or another uh, typical thing is that you'll copy a, a set of, say, two or three lines and you'll enter them and the first two lines execute and then the last one is just kind of doesn't execute because you didn't hit enter. Um, so generally when you paste, probably a good idea to just hit enter a few times just to make sure that you're uh, actually executing all of those commands. Uh, otherwise you'll go and paste in an, the next step and it'll be sort of appended onto the previous step and it'll create kind of a garbled thing that will just result in an error. Um, being in the wrong directory at the wrong time, so a lot of the, 
everything kind of flows from one step to the next step. So sometimes if you kind of navigate away and are sort of poking around and then you go to continue on uh, at a step that you had, hadn't gotten to yet, sometimes you'll be in the wrong place at the wrong time. So just keep an eye out for that. Uh, and then there's some environment variables uh, that need to be set, but we pretty much have that sorted out so that you don't need to worry about it. Um, the I'm just really going to briefly describe the tutorial st steps here. The wiki has much more complete instructions and commentary on what all of the commands are. Um, if you do see a command and there's something in there that seems like sort of jargon or it isn't explained, um, please ask or let us know and we'll try to sort of make it more self-explanatory. Any lines that begin with the hash symbol are, are comments, so you can go ahead and paste those into the command line, but nothing will happen. It's just sort of been commented out. Um, all the other lines that you see in the sort of uh, command boxes on the wiki are, are meant to be executed. Um, as I said, each command is annotated with uh, basic commentary. Um, we've provided some reference materials for Linux. Actually, the wiki has a whole bunch of uh, learning Linux uh, and command line resources. These are some of the tools that we're going to be using. This is just provided for your reference with sort of links to the, the installation documents for each of them uh, if you want to refer back to them later. We're going to obtain a reference genome. Uh, in our case, we're getting our reference files from Ensemble, which is a, a European organization that helps to organize reference genomes and annotations of those genomes. Uh, this analysis is based on GRCH38, which is the latest uh, build of the human reference genome uh, that is in part actually created at Washington University where we work. So we're one of the, the main centers that's still maintaining the, the reference genome and trying to improve it and fill the remaining. Uh, gaps and fix errors. Um, for this tutorial, we're just using a single chromosome. So we've picked chromosome 22 because it's one of the smallest chromosomes uh, and that allows the analysis to happen more quickly. Um, and the data has been kind of paired with that as well. But we provide instructions for downloading the, the full uh, reference genome as well. Uh, the reference annotations are also from Ensemble, so we're going to basically download a, a GTF file from Ensemble. And again, we've kind of cut that down to just cover the genes on chromosome 22 so it matches. We're going to create an indexed reference genome. So this is something that is typically done for almost every aligner. There's a step where you download the aligner, you download the reference genome, you use a tool that comes with the aligner to create an index of the, the reference genome. So this is basically like uh, creating a kind of lookup table that allows uh, the aligner to more quickly find places in this massive reference genome space. Uh, and that's uh, a big part of how the alignment is able to happen as quickly as it does. Uh, and one needs to be pretty careful with these indexes, so they tend to be particular to each alignment tool uh, and sometimes even versions of that tool. So uh, there are many different RNA-seq aligners out there, and you can't really mix and match their, their indexes. If you're going to use a HiSat aligner, then you need to index your genome with the HiSat indexing tool. Um, so it's something to, to watch out for. Uh, the RNA-seq data has been, again, we've kind of pre-filtered it so that all of the reads that are there, we already know that they're going to map to chromosome 22. This is, again, just for kind of efficiency sake. Uh, otherwise, we would be, even though we've cut our reference genome down to just chromosome 22, if we just aligned random reads against it, most of them just wouldn't happen to hit the reference genome. So we'd be spending a lot of time searching and not getting many alignments. <clears throat> the test data comes from uh, two RNA sources. Uh, one is called the Universal Human Reference, uh, and the other is the Human Brain Reference. The Universal Human Reference is a, a, a collection uh, of different cell lines, uh, and the Human Brain Reference is uh, brain tissue from, I think, 20 individuals that have kind of just been pooled together. So both of these things are kind of arbitrary, not very biologically meaningful uh, RNA sets, and the comparison isn't really that much more meaningful either. Um, but we expect them to be quite different. Um, and to represent a lot of transcription events. We have multiple in people uh, covered by them and multiple tissues, uh, so we should see quite rich uh, representation of the transcriptome, and we expect to see a lot of differences between just a mixture of random cell lines and uh, human brain samples. Um, each sample has also uh, been spiked in with a, a control reagent, so there are two versions of this control reagent. It's called the ERCC RNA reagent, and there's sort of two mixes. Um, and the idea of this is kind of like a ladder. Uh, 
uh, on a gel. You have a bunch of um, RNA sequences that were sort of uh, constructed artificially to, to be very unique and to not match anything in the human genome. Uh, and they've been spiked in to this mix at different concentrations. So we have some where we have put them in at, at really high concentrations, medium, low, and very low, um, and that the ratio of them is known. So we have this prior expectation for this, these 90 or so transcripts that we expect to see one, this one being really rare and this one being a little bit more higher and this one higher and higher and higher. So we kind of know in advance what the, what the distribution of them should look like. Uh, and then similarly, there's a, a mix one and mix two where the sort of the relative ratios of those things have been swapped around. So that if we pick mix one in one of our samples and mix two in the other sample, we have again an expectation for certain fold changes to come out of it. So we can compare both the, the differential expression analysis and the abundance expression analysis against these prior expectations for the, the spike in controls. Uh, and this really allows us to do a pretty uh, robust QC of the data um, generation and analysis. So we'll know if anything has gone totally nuts um, in the way the data is generated or, or being analyzed. The input data is in, in FASTQ format. I've got a reference there to, to how the FASTQ format works. Um, this is just a little bit more detail on each of those uh, sources of our data with some links to even more details about uh, each of these samples. Uh, in this case, we're going to have some replicates to allow us to do kind of a uh, replicate experiment in the differential expression analysis. So we have basically three replicates of the UHR libraries and three replicates of the HBR library. So we have six samples in total. And then for each of those samples, we're going to, uh, depending on which step, we might have two files. So for read one and read two. So our input, raw input data is basically going to be 12 files, uh, read one and read two for all six of our samples. We're going to play around with this pre-alignment QC tool. It's called FastQ uh, a little bit. Um.